my castaway this week is uh, someone who many people might like to see on a desert island, extremely popular with the men he leads. He nevertheless appears to be intensely disliked by those with whom he clashes. A fiery orator and a committed socialist, he's defended his cause with a passion which means he cannot be ignored. He is, of course, the president of the National Union of Mine Workers, Arthur Scargill. Arthur Scargill, like it or not, you are something of a bête noire to many. How much does that worry you? It doesn't worry me. It sometimes saddens me that people can have an image of a person that's not true. And I suspect that it's um, comparable with the soap operas on television. I remember my wife and daughter a few years ago uh, watching the Forsyth saga. And each week, each episode they were absolutely condemning one of the central characters, Soames. And one week I came home and uh, there was so much sympathy for Soames that I couldn't believe it. And I said, but hang on a second, what's gone wrong? And they said, well, his wife has committed adultery and gone off with another man and uh, obviously they felt terribly sorry for Soames. And it suddenly struck me that this was an image rather than the reality of the person. And I think what happens is that the image of Arthur Scargill disguises the reality of the person and it's only when people actually meet me that they discover the real me and when they do by and large they say that you are different from the person we thought you were so while it saddens me i understand it well now arthur you're off to this desert island and i mean who knows you may be um, extremely happy to get away from all sorts of other people let alone what they think about you will you be any good at fending for yourself Oh yes, I'm a, I'm a dab hand at making fish and chips for example and I uh, would certainly have a go at constructing a hut of some kind and uh, try to make life on the desert island as comfortable as possible but I'm pretty orderly in my everyday life and so therefore I would try and get some kind of plan on the desert island that would enable me to have a store of food, it would enable me to have uh, proper living accommodation so that uh, until the time came when I was rescued, hopefully, I would survive in uh, surroundings that were at least reasonable. You've been thinking about this, haven't you? Yes, ever since I got your invitation. <laughs> now, how have you set about choosing these eight records? Are they memories or are they just things you like? Well, they're a mixture of both. In my early days, I was um, a fanatic uh, as far as jazz was concerned. And I've always paid particular attention to the great black jazz musicians in uh, America. And one of my favourite pieces of music is the uh, Scott Joplin piece, The Entertainer. The Entertainer by Scott Joplin from the original Sting soundtrack. Arthur Scargill, is there something of the entertainer in you, do you think? Oh, yes, I think there is. Particularly when I appear on a public platform and uh, make a public speech. I think you see a completely different Arthur Scargill in those circumstances than you do, for instance, on television or on a radio programme. The fact is that you're able to give the complete picture in, say, a 40 or 50 or 60-minute speech. 
and you're able to throw pieces of humour into the speech, which you're not able to do when you've been very severely cross-examined by a, a television or a radio <laughs> interviewer. So, but yes, it, there is. But isn't it more than that? Isn't it actually the feeling of power as you raise those people up or depress them or whatever you do? I mean, isn't that what you enjoy? No, it isn't. It, it, it's actually because I believe in what I'm doing that it comes out uh, possibly to the observer in that fashion. I find that because I believe so passionately in what I do, that it communicates itself to the audience. And that's the reason that you can feel the audience going with you and coming to its feet at certain points, um, clapping you very loudly. And I suspect that anybody who has been in that position will confirm that view, that uh, if you speak uh, very passionately about something that matters, your audience begin to identify with you and they begin to see very clearly that what you're talking about is something that they have been thinking about for a considerable period of time, but possibly never put into their words that they wanted to hear, and you've articulated for them what they wanted. I find that, uh, by and large, I'm able to communicate with people extremely well from a public platform. I prefer a public speech, for example, than uh, a lecture. It allows me to uh, really have a go. Let's go back to um, the very beginning, you as a little boy. Um, did you always want to have a go? I was always a bit of a rebel. Uh, even at school, I um, had a habit of questioning and wouldn't allow uh, the teacher to simply say something without me asking why. And were you popular with the other children? Yes, I found that uh, I was reasonably popular with the other kids at school. I played soccer. I was a, a soccer fanatic. I also was pretty good at wrestling. And uh, later in life, I, of course, for 10 years, I did judo. But I was reasonably popular with the lads. And it's and, all coming uh, useful. It's all coming useful, particularly in <laughs> certain instances when telephone kiosk doors have been wrenched open and <laughs> blokes with snooker cues have appeared. Uh, now, you were an only child, Arthur. Yes, I was. Can you remember your mother? Because she died when you were quite young, didn't she? She died, actually, when I was 18. I remember my mother with probably more vivid uh, recollection than anything else in my life. It was the most devastating period of the, the whole of my life when she died. And for three months, it literally rendered me uh, unable to function properly. I was very, very close to my mother because my father in the Second World War was in the Royal Air Force. And so my mother and I became inseparable. And uh, she died when she was 50 years of age. She was a Christian. Uh, she was a, a, a very lovely woman. And uh, obviously, I loved her very much indeed. I often think back and uh, regret deeply that she never saw any of the things that I was able to achieve in later life because the only thing that she ever saw me do was to go down the pit and join the Young Communist League. And both of those things she disapproved of because she didn't want me to get hurt down the pit and she didn't want me to get hurt by joining the Young Communist League. Do you think she would have been proud of you today? I'm sure my mother would have been as proud of me as I was of her. Shall we have another record? Yes, I think a record that um, epitomises my feeling about my mother. She was a Christian. Incidentally, so am I. It's a beautiful hymn. It's called, Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go.
the hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go, sung by the London Emmanuel Choir. Tell me about your father, Arthur. He was a miner. Yes, he was, and uh, he has been a lifelong communist as well. My father, in many ways, was the very opposite of my mother. My mother was strictly non-political. My father was very political indeed. And I was brought up in a, in a household filled with love, but also uh, filled with this um, marvellous contradiction. My mother, who used to go uh, to church, and my father, who used to go to the Communist Party meeting and to the meetings of the National Union of Mine Workers. Were there lots of arguments in the house then? Oh, no, there were no arguments in the house, funnily enough. My mother s totally supported my father, absolutely loved him, and, uh, of course, it was reciprocated. But um, I found that I used to have lots of discussions with my father, although he never, ever tried to persuade me to adopt his political persuasion. He thought it was best that I make up my own mind, and it wasn't until I was about 14 that I asked him if I could go to a political meeting with him. So what was it like, that, that first descent into your, your father's habitat, if you like? The first day at work was almost indescribable. I remember walking the pit yard at Woolley, which is a, a colliery to the uh, north of Barnsley, and it was a dank, dark morning, and I was put into the engineer's office to await the big man coming along. There were about six of us waiting, and he duly came into the office about ten minutes to six. And he was wearing a pork pie hat. And he says, what we got here? And uh, what we got here, of course, were six young lads who were terrified. And he told his assistant to take us down into the screens. Now, the screening plant was a, an area where you had a job picking out the rock from the coal as it went past on a conveyor belt. And we went across the pit yard and down some steps under some uh, very dark areas and then down some more steps into an area which I can only describe as being comparable to Dante's Inferno. The dust was so thick you couldn't see more than about a foot or two foot in front of you and the noise was so intense that I actually learned within the space of three weeks to speak with sound language. I had to exist in that atmosphere for nearly a year and it certainly had a tremendous influence on the way that I reacted towards other people. Can we hear your third record? My third record is one that um, I've always uh, loved since I first heard it, and it's a section from Orpheus in the Underworld by Offenbach. Orpheus in the Underworld by Offenbach, part of the overture played by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Douglas Gamley. Why is it, Arthur Scargill, then, if being down the pit is such a, a noisy hell, as you describe, why is it that it has such a romantic image? If it's not being sexist, I suppose it's like being married. You have amazing rounds, but you always go back. I think what it is is that there is a degree of comradeship in the mining industry that you'll not find anywhere else, probably apart from, say, the, the fishing industry. And it's because of the closeness of the people in the environment in which they work. And I recall vividly working with these young lads in uh, real dangerous circumstances and feeling a sympathy for them and them for me so that um, if one of them was threatened with anything say, disciplined by the management. We saw it as an attack upon ourselves. And how quickly did you spot 
amongst these these six young boys you describe you go down the pit with how quickly did you spot that what they needed was a champion a leader somebody to stand up for them i think uh, relatively quickly i mean i thought that the the uh, circumstances in which we were working were so appalling that they needed challenging but uh, what happened when i went down the pit itself i was working with a whole group of young lads and I found that before the holiday period, everybody else in the pit, when they finished work, were allowed to go home immediately prior to the holiday commencing. But for some inexplicable reason, the young lads were not allowed to do this, even though they finished their work. They were compelled to stay down. And so the lads asked me if I'd be the spokesman. And I went into the manager's office, and it seemed to me that the manager's office was about 300 feet in length. It seemed to take me so long to walk across the room. And the manager was sitting there smoking a pipe. And he said, what's that I want, lad? And I said, well, I've, uh, I've come to represent all the lads in the pit bottom. Oh, aye. Right. About what? And so I explained to him the case. And I said, and what we're asking, Mr Steele, is for permission for us to go home when we've completed our work just today. He says, thou knows I can't give you that permission. And just as we went to the door, he said, they'd be better off than us training in Moscow, thee, rather than here. And I went out and I thought, I haven't succeeded in those negotiations. And I suddenly realised he hadn't said no. It simply said he couldn't give us permission. And so when the time came at the end of the shift for us to come out, I promptly led them all out with the rest of the men. And to everybody's astonishment, we all got paid our full wages. And from that moment on, I was regarded as something of a champion in the pit. The first taste of power. Let's have your fourth record. I'd like to hear the Beale Street Blues by Louis Armstrong and the All Stars. You'll see pretty browns in beautiful gowns. You'll see tailor-mates and hand-me-downs. You'll meet honest men and pickpocket skill. You'll find that business never closes till somebody gets killed. If Beale Street could talk, if Beale Street could talk, married men would have to take their beds in war, except one or two who never drink booze. And the blind man on the corner who sings the Beale Street Blues, he said, I'd rather be here than any place I know. Yes, I'd rather be here than any place I know. It's gonna take the sergeant for to make me go. The Beale Street Blues by Louis Armstrong and the All Stars. H how do you relax, Arthur? I mean, do you have people round and play them your old jazz record? No, I relax by listening to music like that. I also watch television, which I find quite therapeutic, actually. I think it's because I can concentrate on it without being too deeply uh, involved. And I also go for walks with uh, my dogs. I've got three beautiful Airedale dogs. My daughter, of course, says they're her dogs, so the, there's a challenge there. And we've got uh, geese, which we've named appropriately, Gaddafi, Gorbachev and Gromyko. Um, <laughs> I also like uh, soccer. I'm a soccer fanatic, and whenever I get the chance, I still like to go see a good soccer match. Well, now, you, you met and married your wife, Anne, when you were 23 in the early 60s. How did you meet? Well, I met her as a result of uh, working with her father, although I never suspected for one moment that he got a daughter. I discovered that she was learning to drive a car. So I promptly offered my services as an expert driver uh, to teach her how to drive. We went for a drive and I invited her to a jazz concert, to hear Chris Barber, and uh, within a few months' time, uh, we had played together and uh, got married. Now, it was just after that, in your mid-twenties, that you went off uh, to university on a sort of day release, wasn't it? Yes, the National Union of Mine Workers had adopted a scheme uh, 
for sending what it called its talented young people uh, to university on a day release course for three years. And we uh, could go along and take economics, industrial relations and social history. And you could either go to the University of Leeds or University of Sheffield, dependent, of course, if you were accepted. And uh, I went along uh, to the University of Leeds for three years. I actually got offered a place at Oxford as a result of that, but couldn't afford to go. But during the time that I was at the university, I learned many of the skills to, which we previously talked about, including one which I've always been uh, very, very pleased that I, I adopted. And that was the ability to read newspapers very quickly indeed. Ironically, the tutor at Leeds University was a former aide to Winston Churchill, and he was the man who taught me how to do this uh, reading of a newspaper very quickly. But at the start of the day, if you read the newspapers like that, then when someone rings up from uh, a national newspaper or radio or television and asks you about what's in this morning's paper, you, you know exactly what they're talking about. It's in the Scargill file. It's in the Scargill file, yes. Let's hear your fifth record. Well, my fifth record of, has got something to do with my home life in the sense that um, I've talked already about my three wonderful Airedale dogs and uh, I suppose most people have had the experience, the tragic experience of, of losing one of their dogs but uh, also uh, having had the love of that animal. And I'd love to hear Old Ship sung by Elvis Presley. When I was a lad, that old ship was Over hills and meadows with strength Just a boy and his dog We were both full of fun We grew up Old Ship, sung by Elvis Presley with the immortal Jordan Ayres. Well, Arthur Scargill, you rose quickly through the miners' ranks to become the local delegate and then the youngest ever regional president, president of Yorkshire, then national president, and in many ways the rest is history. But you must surely, during that time, have been tempted to go into politics proper to try for a seat at Westminster. No, I haven't. Quite the reverse. I was actually tempted in my younger days, when I was 15, 16, 17, to try for a full-blooded political career, which would involve standing for the local council, which I did, and eventually, hopefully, standing for Parliament. And then I made a quite conscious decision to concentrate my work in the trade union movement, and I've never regretted it. It's interesting to note that I've been offered at least six parliamentary seats during the past um, 14 or 15 years. And uh, I mean that quite seriously, that they were all offers of certain seats, and none of them uh, was attempted to take. I've also been offered, of course, uh, leading positions in the National Coal Board, and I wasn't t tempted to take those either. But don't you feel in the end that Westminster is where, where the real power lies? You promise you weren't going to tell jokes on this programme. No, I don't. In fact, quite the opposite. In real terms, power is uh, in the trade union and labour movement, I suppose in the CBI and the Institute of Directors. It's um, not really comparable. If you're a backbench MP in Parliament and you look at the record, they can't get very much done. And that's not to criticise them, because they do as well as they're able uh, in the circumstances that uh, present themselves to them. But unless you're a cabinet minister, then really you're not uh, in a situation or a position where you're going to be able to achieve anything. And if you look at the average uh, span when a person be is in a cabinet, it's very limited indeed with a few notable exceptions, I suppose including uh, certain members of the present cabinet. 
But um, if you ask someone, for example, who is the MP for so-and-so constituency, they'd have very great difficulty in telling you. On the other hand, if you ask them who is the president of the NUM or who is the general secretary of the Transport and General Workers' Union, I've no doubt they'd tell you instantly. Do you believe, before the end of this century, your kind of socialist Britain could be achieved? Well, I'm not a dreamer, but what I am is a realist, and I think that uh, it's a certainty that we'll have a socialist system. The one thing I would never do is to be daft enough to commit myself to say it will occur on such and such a date or at such and such a time. Because I know from experience, not only here, but uh, in many parts of the world, that circumstances can alter quite dramatically and change things literally overnight. So all I would say is that the inevitability of socialism is there for all to see. Because we can't carry on with the system where we do produce too much food and we put it into a great big warehouses to rot at the same time as we see people die of starvation in the third world. And if for no other reason than that, and wanting to bring about a world without nuclear weapons, a world of peace, I think that Britain and its people eventually will turn towards a socialist alternative. Your next record? My next record has nothing to do with my politics, although it is the 1812 Overture by Tchaikovsky, but I'd like it played, if I may, by the mass bands from the Minus Concert in Yorkshire. Because the first time I heard it, I also heard the legendary Paul Robeson. And I was so struck by the concert itself, but by the 1812 in particular, that it's always remained with me a firm favourite. So, the 1812, please. <laughs> Twelve Overture by Tchaikovsky, played by massed bands from Yorkshire, conducted by Ray Jenkins. Let's talk about the strike, the year-long miner strike, often called Scargill Strike. Now, as you sit on your desert island, Arthur, and rerun it through your head, which you must have done many times, but you'll certainly do on the island, what will you think? What will you think I should have done that differently? I don't think I would think that I should do anything differently, quite frankly. And that's not to be bigoted. If there was one thing that the miners didn't do, it was to take action before they did. Because all you have to do is to look at the books that have already been written by people like Ian McGregor or Peter Walker, and you can see at an instant that the strike was created deliberately by both the National Coal Board and the Conservative government. And I had actually warned uh, in 1981-82 that it was the Coal Board and government's intention to bring about a pit closure programme. Tragically, not only were there many people outside the mining industry who didn't believe me, including the media, there were also sections of the miners' union who didn't believe me either. They thought I was scaremongering. They thought that I was just uh, merely flying a kite. I think that the events over the past three or four years have demonstrated that I was absolutely correct. But in the end, you and they lost, so something must have been done wrong. Well, I don't accept that in the end we lost. I think that if you look at the strike itself and take it into context, I think you'll see that it uh, led to an inspiration as far as the labour and trade union movement was concerned. And it's often been said, you know, in history that people have lost things. It was said the suffragettes lost. 
But as you and I talk here today, Sue, you know that the suffragettes didn't lose. It was said that the toll puddle martyrs lost. But when we look back, we know that the trade union movement in this country and in other parts of the world flourished because of their sacrifice. And I think that eventually we shall see not only the triumph of working people in establishing the right to work, but we shall see the establishment of socialism because of, and not in spite of, the minor strike. But it was an enormous pressure. I mean, we know you're a workaholic, but nevertheless, you, you probably had very little sleep during that time, and this constant pressure. Did you ever quietly, privately, briefly crack? Never once. And the reasons are simple ones, you. I believed passionately in what I was doing, and I knew that the cause was absolutely right. And when I'm sitting on that desert island, I'll be able to sit back under that palm tree, looking out over that beautiful stretch of sand and say to myself, what I did was right. And above all, I never sold out the men. And I think that recent events have shown that they know very well that Arthur Skigel would never sell them out. But there's, uh, there's your wife and there's your daughter, both walking around bearing this name, Scargill, which, as we've said so many times, arouses all these emotions. They must sometimes wish they didn't carry that name. Well, of course, and they get into some real scrapes with it. I mean, my wife went to the dentists in the middle of the miners' strike, and uh, she went into the um, dentist chair, and he looked at the card and he said, Scargill? And she said, rrr, rrr, because she... Uh, she had her mouth spragged open with these <laughs> pincers. And he said, any relation to the miners' leader? And she shook her head. She said, no, none whatsoever. <laughs> Which the, I think was prudent on her part at the time. The cock crew, did it? <laughs> Shall we have your next record? Yes, I think it's an appropriate one as well at this stage because looking back on the miners' strike, I think if Edith Piaf was to sing for me, no regrets, it would epitomise what I feel. No. No Regrets, sung by Edith Piaf. Now, Arthur Scargill, you're a workaholic, as we've said. You're going to get jolly bored on this island, however ordered you say you're going to be. I take it you're, you're not terribly good at lying in the sun. No, I'm not. Um, and, in fact, if I do go on holiday, I want to look around at um, things away from the beach. But uh, what I'd be doing, of course, in addition to building the hut and ensuring that I was uh, comfortable is planning how to get off an island at some stage. And so I wouldn't be sitting down doing nothing. I'd be making my plans uh, so that you would have the benefit of my moderate approach back here in Britain. Now, as you speak and as you talk about your life, you, you display uh, an admirable lack, some would say, of, of self-doubt. What would you say to those people who say, of course, that perhaps being your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness? that you, you, you don't stop and doubt yourself, you often can't listen to criticism, you are single-minded. I would say that's a matter for them to determine and not for me. But if the criticism is that I'm single-minded, I plead guilty. If the criticism is that I don't doubt what I'm doing is right, I plead guilty. And I think it's important that that's understood because I can accept criticism and obviously I discuss things with my colleagues, but once the decision's taken, then I argue for that and I fight for that decision to the very best of my ability. And I think that's important in politics. I think it's important in trade unionism that people understand that they've got someone who's prepared to lead from the front. Your eighth and your final record, please. Well, as I said, obviously I want to get off that island and uh, I want to listen to a record uh, from Verdi's Nabucco 
the chorus of the Hebrew slaves, because that's a, a, a signal of what can be done when people escape from bondage. And here I am on a desert island. I can escape by some means and come back to Britain and uh, grace your television screens and your radio stations and our newspapers and bring the message back of why Britain should have a better way of life. Chorus of the Hebrew Slaves from Verdi's Nabucco, sung by the Triorchi male voice choir. It's a wonderful sound, that, Arthur. It's beautiful. So, Arthur, you're sitting on this beach, pondering which of these eight records to put on the gramophone, and then a wave comes along and snatches seven of them away. Which one do you hope it leaves behind? Without question, the one that would remind me of my mother. Oh, love that will not let me go. And books. You have the Bible... You have the complete works of Shakespeare. What other book would you like to have? A book that um, brings back with it memories. It was bought for me by my mother. It's given me enormous pleasure as I've read it and reread it over the years. And it's Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. And you're allowed one luxury, Arthur. You said you liked your luxuries. You like your yeah. creature comforts. It has to be an inanimate object. What is it? Well, in that case, I would have to say that I'd like a a little-known painting called the Mona Lisa. Could I have it? Yes, but why? Because I always regarded this painting from a distance as being overrated. And I used to go over to France quite a bit at one time. And on one occasion, I went to visit the museum and I decided I had to see the painting, if for no other reason, that when people asked, I could say, yes, I've seen it. And I went and looked at that painting and I suddenly realised what da Vinci had done. He had painted a masterpiece, probably the greatest painting of all time. I fell in love with it then and I'm still in love with it now. Arthur Scargill, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. <laughs> 